Good evening everyone, I'm Nathan here with my wonderful wife Laura Hello And we're here to do a quick look at and review of the Very Hungry Caterpillar Spin and Seek ABC game Just in case you didn't know your ABCs Yeah, so obviously this is aimed towards very young children um, We obviously had it for our children when they were of the age Yes, so this is uh, preschool, so 3 plus Although it should say three to like six or something. Yeah, I was gonna say the plus really doesn't belong there. So um, yeah, we thought we'd take a quick look at it because we're probably not gonna have it for very long because our kids are getting older. Yeah, so um, it's pretty much teaching you about ABCs, capital letters, and non-capital letters using a hungry caterpillar. Yes, of, of course, the hungry caterpillar. Yes, book. The world of Eric Carle, obviously he. Wrote The Hungry Caterpillar and a whole bunch of other books. Indeed. Um, so we're just going to have a look. We're not going to play it, and you'll see why as we explain how you play. And obviously it is about learning our alphabet, oh which we boy. already know. So. It's <laughs> certainly an, an experience. Alright, so we will have uh, a scan of the instructions in the description down below, just in case you find the game and for some reason those are missing. It's a fairly, so that, that's it. Yeah. So The rest is just advertising. All right, that's just a frame where you could like push the pieces out of. Here we have a la board. So let's open that up. Now we will see, you actually need a lot of space for this to play. You do, and again, you'll see why in a minute. So the board isn't huge um, compared to your average sized board. Um, but as you can see, we have the whole alphabet, both with upper and lower case versions of each letter. So now, why do you need a lot of space, Laura? So the reason you need space is because the idea is to collect as many letter cards as you can starting uh, up here at A all the way through to Z and whoever has the most at the end is the winner. So there are cards for every single letter. Item. They're also stuck in the box. Uh, they also give you three blank ones if you lose any or if your kids want to draw their own. All right, so... Every card has uh, one for each, one for the capital. They're not going to be in order because we played this with our kids last time we had it out. Uh, and then you have the lower case. So there's an orange border around all of the upper case or capitals and a blue border around the lower case. Because some of them are harder to tell if they're upper or lower case, like C's and V's and things like that. So it's right. all color coded. Yep. So on the back of those, is exactly what it is. So this one says it's a big R, like to confirm. And an example, like a rainbow. Exactly, so they all have those. There's a lot of animals um, on a lot of them. Which makes sense considering the subject matter and the author. Yeah, I mean, kids are more likely to want to see like animals and, and flowers and such, aren't they? Little A, big B. Still click. Um, also the capital and then like the lower case both have the same thing on it, so. For example, we have the big F has a flower and the little F has just a slightly smaller flower. Now, um, the reason you need a lot of space is you basically need to lay, uh, lay out every single one of these cards uh, face down so just the letter is showing. Yes. So that means you've got to have quite a big space available to play because you've got to have the board and these all laid out. Yes, so on the floor. It's Definitely. always the best place to go. They all have to be like laid out, for example, like this. Not in order, just random. The idea is that your kids or yourself, if you're playing with them, you have can to try and, see them. And you have to try and hunt them out and find out the specific one. Because if you had them all in order, it'd be easier for the... Still kind of easy. If your kids know their letters, the chances are it's going to be relatively yeah. simple. So what you do is you take one of these playing pieces that Nathan has. Which is just hard cardboard and a little plastic stand there. You've got a seahorse lion of course the hungry caterpillar and a deliciously looking bear they're both oh they're all i should say deliciously looking bear that's not I even a thing i don't know why the bear is delicious looking no all right so you take one of those you start up here at the start space and in turn you'll then spin the spinner uh starting with the youngest player so which would be me i'd spin all right so over here nathan has spun either big or one. Yeah, so you can do two options depending on the spin. You can either move ahead one, or I can go to the next big slash capital letter that's next in line in front of me. Yes, now sometimes that might be the same one. In this case, if Nathan moved one space, he'd be on capital A, and if he goes to the next big letter, he'd be on the capital A. But if I was already on a capital A and I spun that, I could move ahead to small a, or I could move straight ahead to the capital B. Yes. Now, the re you might be thinking, well, what's the point? Why not just have a number or like the big or little? Well, that's because if someone else is ahead of you, maybe they've already collected the lowercase a. 
So once they successfully search for and find the card, they then keep that card for the rest of the game. That's a point for them. And other subsequent people, if they land on that space, cannot recollect that card. Exactly. So that might be why you don't want to land on that, because that means you've then got to spin and move again anyway. Um, so Nathan's moved on. Someone I lands there. That letter's already gone. You would spin again. Or if you maybe have the option of going to the next big one instead, you might do that rather than re-spinning. Because then I could go ahead and at least try and go for that capital B card and get a point. Yes. So every time you land on one, you look for one around all of the cards and yeah, keep it. That's that's essentially it. <laughs> so you basically spend the whole game, you go all, you pretty much go through almost all the alphabet. You want to go as slow as you can because obviously you want more opportunities to collect letters. You don't, you don't want to be moving four every time and skipping No, it's, not, it's not a race. So, for no. instance, say Laura got to the end and she had 10 cards. Mm -hmm. I took my time and I ended up with, say, 14. Mm -hmm. I would still win because I had more cards slash more points. Yes. Um, so, this is a little bit different from most board games in that it doesn't finish when, like, one person gets to the end. Everybody has to get to the end. Think a uh, game of life. Similar sort of concept, right. even though everyone someone... has to finish. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, what you do is, if someone then finishes, the other one can keep collecting as long as there are still letters available and they haven't all been collected, of course, before they got there, and tally them up after everyone's done. So now, he here's go on. I was going to say here's the problem with it. Yes. Our kids um, were quite happy to learn the alphabet early on. They caught on pretty quick. And then it was like, okay, got to find the capital E, there it is. And there was, no one ever got any wrong. If you get them wrong, you don't get to take the card. No. Um, so basically it, it was very, very, very tedious. Because yes. no one was getting any wrong. It's a very slow moving game, even if you're getting the bigger numbers or whatever. But when you've got like, what, 52 cards out and they're all spread all the way around the board and you're waiting for a three or four year old to look for it, even if they know what it looks like, They've got to scan through every row of cards to try and find well, it. Well, same thing. I mean, even if we, we know the letters, obviously, we're looking for a small I or a big L and in amongst 50-something cards, that's still going to take some time. And mm. if you factor in the fact you can play with four players mm -hmm. who are most potentially younger, yes. you're looking at quite a lengthy time. Agreed. So this is, this is great, yes, um, for learning the alphabet, but like we said at the start, it shouldn't say three plus, it should maybe say like three to five, I would say. Because um, by the time you're getting to that age, your kids are probably quite comfortable with at least like the general like look of letters and things and are probably heading to school. Yeah, and if they already know the alphabet well, um, there's no real entertainment wise. No. It's just going it, one or two and then... Purely yeah. educational. Um, I think they still sell it new. It's not a very expensive game. So if you do want it just for like a year or two for your kids learning, then certainly... And our kids did enjoy it when they were sort of of the age. Yes, agreed. And then, yeah, so I mean, you know, you're not investing a lot of money for them then learning the alphabet. Them learning the alphabet. That made sense somewhere along the line. I'm sure it did. So not a bad game, but for a very limited age. Yes. Mm. If you enjoyed watching this video, give us a thumbs up. Let us know in the comment section down below if you had games like this when you were a kid. Did you have something that was purely educational but really wasn't fun for others to join in with? Or did you have any other of the Eric Carl board games? Because there actually is quite a few board games based on his books. Well, there's a few. Yeah. Yeah. Hit that subscribe button and check back soon. We have videos every single Tuesday. Sounds good. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.